Um, this talk with Eric Snow, it's uh, Interfaces in Python. So everyone uh, give a round of applause for Eric Snow. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. So uh, I'm Eric Snow. I, I, I put there at the bottom a little short URL to a copy of the slides I'm going to be presenting. So feel free to follow along. But uh, you know, anyway, there you go. Um, and Eric Snow, I'm just an ordinary guy, and I uh, feel a little intimidated because I'm sure there are a lot of people in here that know a lot more than I do about interfaces. But here I am. I'm giving the talk, so you have to listen to me. Um, also, just want to point out any examples I give, I've tried to be faithful in doing them in Python 3. So. Um, so if you try and run them in Python 2, they may or may not break. All right. First of all, this is something about which I, I'm really excited. I'm no expert by any means, but I am an enthusiast. Interfaces are a great thing, and we're going to talk specifically about object interfaces in Python. Um, you know, there are lots of different kinds of interfaces. We're not going to talk about them. You know, you can talk about interfaces in lots of different ways and in other programming languages. Today, we're just going to focus, because there's just so much we could talk about, about how awesome they are in Python. Um, all right. I'm really excited, and I'm sure you can tell. So why are they awesome? Um, there are lots of different things you can get out of interfaces. We're not going to talk about these things, but I just threw some things up that I was thinking about just in uh, the research I was doing for this talk. Good stuff. But really, uh, it boils down to how awesome interfaces are. They provide us so much. And uh, I've thought for a long time that in Python, we really don't think about interfaces in the same way as happened in other languages. I mean, uh, how many people here have used interfaces before? Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, interfaces, right? Well, uh, who hasn't used interfaces? Go ahead. You know, but chances are you have. And this is one point I want to make is, even though we have interfaces in lots of other languages, and Python doesn't have an interface syntax, it has interfaces. It, it's a, a concept that's really tied into a, a lot bigger idea than just a syntax. And so, you know, we can call it by other names, but really what it boils down to is we're just talking to each other. What really matters is how you're using objects, how you're using code when you boil it down. So really the focus of this talk is going to be how we get that in Python. The communication that we do in our code is, you know, we have a variety of means of communicating about our, our code, but really the one we're interested in here is the code itself. You know, what kind of programmatic ways can we define how people should use our code? It can say a lot about how they should use it just by what the code looks like, the interface of functions of classes. What we really care about, though, not just about function protocols and, and that sort of thing, but we're specifically going to talk about object interfaces. And they're a big deal. When we talk about object interfaces, we're talking about how somebody is going to use your object. I mean, talk about object protocols. Uh, talk about object APIs. We, there are lots of different words. You know, we talk about how some uh, object of a, a class or whatever, just a breakfast object, conforms to you know, the, you know, the protocol, interface, the, whatever breakfast implements. It, it really doesn't matter because we're just talking about how people should be thinking about a particular object. Oh, and, and we could talk about how it implements that interface. So what really matters here is Python. What are interfaces in Python? Um, 
we have a, d a number of different ways we can look at it, but uh, first of all, I wanted to walk you just a little bit through the history of interfaces in Python, because the history of interfaces in Python is really long. Uh, it goes way back. Uh, after that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit there about um, just how we have interfaces in Python, both the protocols, which have been around forever, abstract base classes, which are a lot newer, and then very briefly, we'll, I'll, I'll just mention some ideas on how you can build your own interfaces. Okay. So, first of all, storied past. This is a, this, a, the tip of the iceberg, because if you go back, so one thing I did in preparation for this talk is I spent a lot of time reading through all the mailing list archives for Python. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. And I, I was really focused on what it could tell me about the history of interfaces. And that's a great resource for it, because from there, it, it led me in all sorts of directions. But, but these are some of the highlights, and just highlights, because there's so much more than this. It'd be a great exercise for anybody. Um, first of all, I mean, from the very beginning, uh, we've had duct typing. And we'll talk more about duct typing in a minute, but basically, it's been around since the beginning. In 98, uh, there was a special interest group formed to look at, at interfaces. And, and, I mean, like Java kind of interfaces. A lot more formal syntax and, and tools to use interfaces in Python. And later on, we had a couple PEPs. Um, in 04, there was a, a whole episode where Guido posted some uh, blog posts about how we need to have static typing in Python, you know, or optional static typing, and everybody freaked out. So I call it the Great Typing Scare of 2004. And in 2005, just a couple months, or well, really just a month later, and actually mostly as a result of Guido's blog posts, there was uh, just an, an enormous flood of, of debate about interfaces and adaptation. And I mean, at this time, adaptation was the, the thing du jour. It was for sure going to go into Python. And, and if you want to read more up on that, you can look at PEP 246. And basically, after the debate, we ended up going a, a different direction moved away from adaptation more towards generic functions, which you can read more up uh, about that in PEP 3124. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about the, these different options, but, but really you can see that there, there's a, a long history here of, of thinking about interfaces in Python. And the issue is so complex that from 1998 and before that, all the way through 2007, the community really couldn't come to a conclusion on what the best route was. And, and really, even, uh, I think it finally just came to Guido saying, you know, this has gone on long enough and, and ABCs is it, but there's a little more to it than that, but we won't go too far into that. A lot of history. And uh, I hope you recognize just how much thought has gone into interfaces. Ultimately, uh, you know, those two peps died. The roles pep died. Generics, died. I think it's uh, kind of very back burner because it's still compatible with what we got. Um, the work of the type sig ended up rolling into what's now Zoop interface without the S. Um, the generics, I mean, is predated by uh, Phil Beebe's work on Pi protocols and ended up, right now, uh, mostly centered on his peak rules library. But, so, there are lots of things that came out of this, and in the language itself, uh, we're going to focus on the ABCs in a little bit. And just real quick, I mean, if you want to look back, look for these names, especially. I mean, uh, plenty of people were involved in these discussions, but, 
But these are some of the people that were really champions of, of the three different approaches. And uh, Guido, of course, kind of pushed the whole process. Well, great. I hope none of you were too bored with that. I found the, the history of all of that to be really fascinating. And I'm, I'm sorry we don't have more time to spend on it because it's great stuff. Um, protocols. Protocols in Python is... Uh, I guess in some ways, it's a pretty standard usage of the word, but in others, when we talk about Python protocols, we're talking specifically about um, the names for different mechanisms that are in the language itself for accessing different functionality. Like uh, when you call an object, what's going to happen is underneath, the interpreter is going to look for a dunder call method on the object. And if it finds it, it's going to use it. If it doesn't, you'll get an attribute error. But these are protocols. I mean, that, that call protocol, it's you know, an object. If it subscribes to this, this uh, call protocol, then it's going to have that method. So if you go to that URL, you'll find a whole bunch of different protocols that are defined there. And I, I don't remember, I guess I should have double-checked to see if the word protocol is actually used there. But you'll certainly find the, these names there. You'll also find descriptions of it. You won't miss it. Uh, in other places, if you look, you'll find descriptions of the file protocol. Um, I think if you look in the documentation about the built-in types, there's an explanation of that file protocol there. Um, the pickle module, the documentation explains the pickle protocol, um, the copy protocol, uh, and there are many others, just in the language itself. And so it helps if you're, you're using Python to go through and get familiar with what the different protocols are. For ex instance, if you look, go to the documentation for the pickle module, you'll find that it defines an object protocol with these different methods. And so they provide different functionality. And so when you're using the pickle protocol, or the, the pickle module, it'll actually, uh, when you're trying to pickle or unpickle objects, it'll use this protocol to do it. You can actually uh, customize the behavior of pickle by setting these functions on your objects, on your classes. Well, great. And what's interesting is the, the pickle protocol is actually used in other modules as well. But regardless, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. This is probably one of the bigger protocols in Python. So what's interesting about the protocols, though, is that we don't really um, care about if an object actually obeys the protocol or not until we actually go to use it. So really, there's no validation or anything. It's just, I mean, for instance, if we look here, we're able to create this object, the class, the object, great. When we go to call it, it's looking for this dunder call method, right? And what do we get? We get a trace back because Lo and behold, we didn't have a dunder call method. OK, that's what we'd expect. Oh, there you go, type error, not attribute error. But uh, I mean, pretty straightforward. However, if we define one, it's going to work great. And so it. We, it, we really didn't care whether or not it had a call method until we actually used it. And that's the important thing about uh, the protocols in Python. And we'll talk about, I mean, this is kind of the essence of, of duct typing. We'll talk about that in a second. So if, uh, one interesting thing, though, is if we want to implement a protocol and uh, we want to have kind of a, an abstract implementation. I mean, this is the classical way of, of making an 
abstract class in Python, right? We're just going to raise a not implemented error in the methods that we want to be abstract. But again, there's no validation. This is all a, a, a call time sort of thing, which is in contrast to abstract base classes. And we'll talk about how those work, but those are our instantiation time. It actually validates everything. Well, let's, uh, let's take this a little further because all this talk about, about caring whether or not it actually implements a protocol until we need it is the essence of duct typing. We're going to, uh, and these acronyms here, and, and many of you I'm sure are familiar with them, but it's, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission that is really the, a lot more Pythonic than look before you leap. So what we're gonna do, well, for example, right here, a semi-canonical example, we're going to check first, well, in the easier ask forgiveness version, we're just gonna try and, and do the call on the object. And if it fails, we're going to catch it, and we're going to handle it. We'll go from there. We don't care until we actually go to use it. And we don't care if it, fail, if it doesn't have the method until, until we do care. And we can handle it there. In contrast, look before you leap is all about checking first. So in this case, we're just checking to see if it has the dunder call method. And basically doing the same thing. Look before you leap, less Pythonic. And that's uh, it's actually something we'll talk about in a second with abstract base classes because the focus with those is in some ways more on look before you leap. Let's talk a little more about duct typing though because I want to make sure everybody has a clear idea of duct typing because it's so essential to protocols and interfaces in Python. And it's by far the older of the two built-in mechanisms for interfaces. So you can look at it as polymorphism by capability. And in contrast to polymorphism by type, which matters because really when you're using an object, you care about what it does. You're gonna care about how you're gonna use it and uh, you, know, you can reason about it maybe with a more formal interface, but in the end, you're gonna be using it. And that's all you care about at that point. And duct typing, that's what it's for. If you look at what some of the um, people said, these are pulled from mailing list posts way back. Um, Raymond Hedinger, requiring a specific interface instead of a specific type. That's what he, he defined duct typing as. Um, Phil Beebe, determining an object's type by inspection of its method attribute signature rather than by explicit relationship to some type object. And uh, Oz, even without formal interface declarations, good practice mostly depends on conformant interfaces rather than subclassing classing to determine an object's type different takes on it, and, and, and that's kind of the thing. I, everybody thinks of it a little differently, but really it boils down to just caring about whether an object can quack by trying it. If we're gonna check first, well, we're gonna check on the method, and we're not gonna check on the type of the object. Or we're just going to try it and handle the exception if it fails. A little more expensive on the failure side, but you know we're gonna go with the common case, which we expect to be success. We're good to go. However, duct typing is not what we have there where we're checking to see if an object is of the type duck, or if it implements some duck interface or whatever syntax you wanna use. And this kind of leads us to abstract base classes. So this is more a, a type-oriented approach that uh, some people in the community really wanted, have wanted for a long time, 
And uh, as you saw from the history of it, there's a lot of debate about how we could accomplish it. And I, I really appreciate this quote. For some time, Python programmers have wanted simple and efficient means to be able to test object interfaces. Well, I mean, that's pretty appropriate. Uh, right now, it's still kind of appropriate. Well, this was said in 1998, Jim Fulton. So he, uh, he spearheaded the Zope interface and, and the work with Zope, and I mean, that's his thing, right? Well, it's amazing because it took the community uh, with a, a clearly recognized need uh, quite a while to come to conclusion that abstract base classes were the best thing we could do. As far as using them, if you, have a, a, if you already have a, an abstract base class that you can use, we'll talk about how to use one. But first we're going to talk about how you can write your own abstract base class. Probably not talk a super long time about why actually you'd want to use that over duct typing. That would probably be a meaningful discussion too. But first, uh, let's just talk about using them. So here we got an example, pretty straightforward. I mean, all abstract base classes are going to rely on this ABC meta as their meta class. And you really don't got to understand a lot about meta classes in order to use abstract base classes. All you need is a syntax. You're just going to use that meta class, ABC meta, and it's going to do everything for you, except actually make your class abstract. And to do that, we have these decorators. So ABC meta and the decorators are in the ABC module in the standard library. There are a couple others as well, but these are probably the main ones you would use. And by doing this, we're signifying that these are abstract methods. If a class that has ABC meta as the meta class also has abstract methods, then that class is abstract. And if you try and instantiate an abstract base class, which we just created here. Well, if you try and take this one and instantiate it, we're going to get a type error because, I mean, it's pretty clear, uh, we haven't implemented those. They're still abstract. And uh, the problem will happen in instantiation time. If you remember protocols, it was when we go to use it, right? Well, with abstract base classes, it's all about when we go to instantiate our object. Why? I mean, why couldn't we validate it at, uh, when we created the class? It's because the compiler, which is compiling your class, can't tell the difference between an abstract base class, which you intend to be abstract, and one that you just haven't implemented the stuff you need to implement. So. It can't really tell that until you actually go to instantiate it. And then it's like, oh, well, if you're trying to instantiate it, obviously you meant this to be actually usable. And therefore, you know, it still has abstract methods, so it's abstract, so type error. Well, let's say you already have an abstract base class. And the nice thing is we get a bunch in the standard library. If you already have one, then you can inherit from it or you could actually register an existing class as an implementation of that. And there are kind of uh, maybe subtle difference between the two aspects of it. And we'll cover those real quick. But first of all, if we're going to inherit from one in the, um, the collections package, you'll find the ABC module, so collections.abc. And in there, you'll find a whole bunch of different abstract base classes that you can use. Really easy. Mapping is one of them. And so mapping is an immutable mapping, like a, a frozen dict, dict, if you will. Not quite, but, but let's say we want to subclass it. Great. There we go. 
It says it's a subclass, yes. An instance is an instance. Um, right here, the dot, dot, dot assumes that we actually implemented, otherwise it would, it would give us a type error. But the instance is an instance of mapping, great. The base classes, well, there's the base class of it. It's just like normal inheritance. But one difference here, if we check the type of the class, which is the, the meta class, we're going to see it's ABC meta instead of the normal type. So, like I said, in collections.abc, a whole bunch of different abstract base classes that we can use. Um, some of them, they don't, all they do is specify what the protocol is. For a few of the others, they actually give you mix-ins. So you implement a few of the methods, and you get for free a whole bunch of other methods, which is nice. For instance, um, for mapping, let's say we want to have a, a read-only view of an object. So all we have to do is define get item, the dunder link, and dunder iter. Implement those, and mapping is completely implemented, and we get for free a few things. Well, let's make this point first. Uh, we'll see that dict is a subclass of mapping, according to is subclass. Although, that's only sort of true. But that matters because then we can treat our mapping classes just like we would treat dicts, for the most part. So what we get for the mapping abstract base class, uh, on the one side, those abstract methods we had to implement, but for free, we get these mix-ins. You know, we get the get just like you would have in a dict. The equality, really nice. I mean, the, the keys, you, you get all the normal stuff you would get out of a dict. And we've implemented them here, so we're good to go. So we can try it out. We pass in just a normal dict. And lo and behold, we can check that it's sorted. You know, we can try and call get on it, which was one of the mixins we got, keys. You know, and not only that, but now we're going to subclass our class that implemented this abstract base class, and it works like you'd expect it to. Great. Uh, no complications, and its cheese shop is still just a, an implementation of, of uh, the abstract base class mapping. All right, we'll see here. So we've got, uh, you know, you run into problems if you forget stuff, and uh, we're going to wrap things up right now. I'll see. You got some great things about how it all works. Register, magic. And uh, you can go in there and, and learn about it all for yourselves. Um, there's plenty to talk about, as you can see. We're going to just skip through all of this stuff. Something Guido said, it's really funny, I promise you. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of controversies. I won't gloss over it, even though I am. The, but you, you can, if you want, you can go back and read about all the different uh, opinions about abstract base classes. But we ended up getting something that we didn't have before. And that's one of the great things about it. Is it gives us a, a way to programmatically reason about the protocols that we have. Um, some of the different things right here that uh, you can look at different approaches beyond abstract base classes. For the most part, pretty compatible though. Um, and if you want to, you could actually, these are good examples of how to do your own abstract base classes or your own interfaces. All right. And here we are. Um, and uh, I hope you guys are uh, as excited about it as I am about the opportunities we have for interfaces in Python.
Do we have time for questions? No. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>